If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
Comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. He too perished, 
and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow it. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day, in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Christ has risen from the dead, of the Father is crowned with glory and honor. He has given him dominion over the works of his hand. He has put everything under his feet. The epistle is from 1 Peter chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. This is the word of the Lord. I see Forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. 
If you withhold forgiveness from it, it is withheld. Now, Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the marks of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said, Thomas, put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand, and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many of his signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
Spirit. Amen. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. On the morning of our Lord's resurrection, the women, disciples of Jesus, including Mary's mother, pardon, including Mary, Jesus' mother, went to the tomb to do for Jesus what was only hastily done before by Nicodemus and Joseph. That is, they went to the tomb to prepare the body, to prepare the body for death. The reason they knew where the tomb was was because they had followed that body from the cross into the custody of Joseph and Nicodemus and all the way to that place where they buried Jesus. This is the reason why when women go to the tomb in the morning, there's no asking of questions as to where's the tomb? Where do we go? Who do we ask? They already know and they go. Once they arrive to their horror, what they see is the open tomb. To their horror, what they see is an empty tomb. But then to their amazement, they hear those words from the angel that Christ is not dead, but he is alive. And then to their joy, they run into, that is, they encounter Jesus himself, risen from the grave, in the flesh, now present for them, now present for disciples, now present for all people. He is the risen Christ. He has conquered death. Hallelujah. Well, there, Jesus speaks to the women. And you know, in Jesus' ministry, when things like this would happen, he would often forbid or tell the disciples, look, don't tell anybody about this. But now in this case, in this resurrection, Jesus tells the women to go to the disciples, to go to his brothers, and let them know that Christ, in fact, is risen from the dead. Well, women go. They go as instructed. They share the good news with the disciples. The disciples uh, hear this news, and it's Peter and John then who go to the tomb. Peter and John then who launch the investigation to see if what was said is in fact true. And what they find is half the truth. An empty tomb, to be sure. A door that is open, to be sure. But no angel, no Jesus, no confirmation in that sense. Well, how do the disciples handle this? And how do they handle this, this proclamation of the resurrection of the dead? This proclamation that Christ is alive and that he's no longer dead and in the tomb? Well, not very well. Because here it is on the night of our Lord's resurrection, or the evening, I should say, of our Lord's resurrection. And here are the disciples still hiding for fear of the Jews. Here are the disciples still with all the Good Friday kind of bleakness and sadness all about them. Here are the disciples who can say that Jesus, in fact, was crucified, died, was buried. But what they can't say, what they can't confess, what they cannot say as if they believe it is that Jesus has, in fact, risen from the grave. They don't believe it. They don't know it in that sense. They can't confess it, that Christ is, in fact, risen from the grave. Well, it's there in that darkness. It's there in that bleakness. It's there in that fear-filled room that Jesus appears. And he appears in the flesh. It's not a dream, it's not a hallucination, it's not merely his spirit, it's that same body, that same flesh and blood that was crucified and laid into the grave. That flesh and blood, that body is now resurrected and he is present with his disciples. What he says to them is all important. He says to them, peace be with you. And you know, the reason why it's so important is because of any number of things that Jesus could have said at that point, and some of them might readily come to mind. Like, why don't you listen to the women? Why don't you listen to me when I speak with you? Why don't you listen to the scriptures that confess the death and the resurrection? You've been with me for three years. You know these women. They're not born to you. You have all these confessions, all of these words, all of this evidence, but you do not believe. Here you sit, here you stew, here you think about your sins, here you think about your loss. But you know what? That's not the time and place for this. It's not the time and place for this. This is not the place of the law. This is not the place of the application of the law. This is where the gospel reigns. 
This is where the resurrection reigns. And so Christ's words here to his disciples are all important. Not anything like I said, but rather simply and straightforwardly, peace be with you. Well, as an understatement, it says here that they were glad to see the Lord. And definitely so. Now all those things and all those words that were said before, they now come to their fulfillment in their minds and in their faith. What the women confessed and shared with them earlier, they now know these things to be true. True not just in the sense of intellectually true, but experientially true. This is Christ. He is risen. He is with us. He brings us his peace. He brings us his forgiveness. He brings us his life. They are definitely glad, and so are we. He then says to them once more, peace be with you. Watch out for that. And then there's a realization. This peace that Christ has secured for us by way of his death and his resurrection, this peace which is the overcoming of our shame and of our failures by Christ's life and by Christ's faith, faithfulness to his Father, faithfulness to the plan, these things were not just for the disciples, the 10, 11, if you want to count 12, 12 men. These things, this forgiveness, this peace is for all people. For Christ has died for the sins of the world. Christ was sent for the sins of the world, for all people, not just the disciples. And so after receiving this peace, this peace from Christ himself, this peace which they now bear and receive and hold on to, Jesus is now going to prepare them and take that peace out of that room and out into the world. And so the first thing he does is he, to put it in our own terms, he calls them, he ordains them. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. For these years you have been my learners, you have been my disciples, but now you're getting a bump in grade and pay, and you're getting an extra stripe on your uniform. You're going out into the world as my apostles, my sent ones. The ones who hear you will now hear me. And so these apostles now receive this uh, commission. They receive this uh, this opportunity, this, this, this new life, this new vocation, this new calling to go into the world representing Christ, speaking as he even speaks to them. Then you have the breathing out of the Holy Spirit, which is always interesting to hear how people uh, receive this and understand this, because too often people think the Holy Spirit is given as a kind of a tool to the apostles to do their work, which is crazy. The Holy Ghost is no tool. The Holy Ghost is no instrument. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, is the third person of the Trinity. This is God himself. And so it's more like the apostles are, be given to, are being given to the Holy Spirit than the reverse. It's the Holy Spirit now who will be active in the ministry of the apostles. It will be the Holy Spirit who is active in this work of the apostles. The Holy Spirit comes to us not to die and to rise for us, but to bring us the faith of the one who died and rose, namely Jesus Christ. And then finally, the narrow, narrow, narrow purpose and point of this ministry. When it comes to forgiveness, if you forgive anybody their sins, they are in fact forgiven. If you withhold that forgiveness, it is in fact withheld. And you can read this, and you can read this out of context and say, this is, this is a lot of power. You know, here you have people who can do whatever they want in terms of forgiving sins or not forgiving sins, and God here is saying that he's going to back them up. Not true. This is all about the carrying forward of the preaching and teaching of Jesus, even from that very first sermon on that very first time when he says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Because here you have the sending out of the apostles who call us to repentance. And there, as sinners repenting, we receive the forgiveness of our sins. Pastors, in fact, apostles, in fact, have no wiggle room in this regard. If you confess your sins, you receive the forgiveness of sins. No ifs, ands, or buts. No, maybe if you tithe a little more. Maybe if you wash my car. Maybe if you were nicer to me out on the streets. None of that matters. Sinners receive the forgiveness of sins because Christ has died for them. Apostles pronounce the forgiveness of sins because that's their purpose, that's their point. But, for those who do not confess their sins, they hold on to their sins. 
They won't hear the law. They won't hear God's word. They don't want to have anything to do with it. Well, there you have the withholding of forgiveness until they confess their sins. And there, and there they receive what Christ has died for, namely their forgiveness. Well, when you think of this, you hear this, you take it in as a whole now. This is a great thing. It's a wonderful thing. This is why we say, Hallelujah, Christ is risen, He is risen indeed, Hallelujah. Because here you have the Christ who died, Christ who rose. Here you have the very fulfillment of the scriptures, the forgiveness of our sins. Here you have His appearance to the women, and now His appearance to us. Here He has given us a vocation, a calling in this world. We are going forth as His apostles. We're going to forgive sins. We're going to bring along with us a baptism in the Lord's Supper, preaching and teaching, all these good things, all gifts from God. How can this be wrong in any way? How can there be any trouble here in any way? And then they look around the room. You can kind of see in your minds, it's not the scriptures. Somebody's counting nodes, somebody's counting heads, and there's a realization. Where's Thomas? We're here, we've received this, we've received these things, we've seen the risen Christ. But where is Thomas? Where is Thomas? Well, all kinds of speculation, and we have no idea. Some say that Thomas went back to the tomb, went to inspect what the women had said, went to go and see if, in fact, uh, Peter and John did a good job of seeing if the tomb was actually empty. They went to the right spot, so on and so forth. Some say that he simply said, look, I've been locked up with these guys for a few days. Time for me to go and have a little alone time by myself. Something which some of us might now understand. So who knows? It's lost in history. Thomas knows, God knows, God knows. We don't know. But Thomas does return to this group, this we do know. And immediately these disciples turned apostles. They now reveal to him the truth of what took place in his absence. That the Christ came to us. He is alive, not dead, just like the women said. The Christ came to us and he spoke with us. We might add here, there's uh, some certainty here on our part, it's not in the scriptures, that they then explain to him what he said and what he was talking about in terms of the Holy Spirit and now we are his apostles and going forth with forgiveness of sins or the withholding of forgiveness. But now that was shared. Thomas hears all of these things, and what Thomas says is this. I don't believe. Unless I see the holes in his hands, unless I see that wound in his side, put my fingers through the hole, put my hand in the side, I will not believe. And you know, this is the opportunity that people will take to say, Thomas, there's something wrong with Thomas. How can he be so hard-headed? How can he be so hard-hearted? If you think about it, his position is really no different than the disciples, the other disciples, when they heard the news from the women. It wasn't just one woman, but a number of women came, they shared this news, and they said, we're not going to believe it. They go and do the investigation, they come back, no angel, no Jesus, well, we don't believe it. That's why they're stuck in the room, that's why they're in that room in fear, hiding from the Jews. They simply don't believe it. Now, Thomas does add something to this, I have to say, which is, ten of your most trusted friends, all confessing, not joking, all saying the same thing, all talking about something as serious as what the women said, as serious as Jesus rising from the grave. But all of this, from the women, to the disciples, to the apostles, Thomas himself is all just the manifestation, all just the realization of the truthfulness of sin and what it does to the heart and what it does to the mind. It perverts us, it twists us, it turns us against God. When we see Thomas, we want to cast stones, we want to cast aspersions, but we in our hearts outside of Christ are all the exact same as Thomas. That's our problem, that's our issue. Well, eight days later, Jesus returns. No doubt Thomas was testing when he said, unless I see this or unless I see that, I won't believe. Nevertheless, Jesus returns. His words to the group, peace be with you, including Thomas. And then Jesus cited precisely the words that Thomas spoke about the holes in hand, about the 
of the wound in the side, that he should put his fingers down into those holes and put that hand into the side. But Thomas never gets there. Thomas never takes Jesus up on that opportunity. He sees the Lord, and now that word that was spoken to him, and that reality that is now before him, it all comes together, and all Thomas can do is confess the truth, confess the reality, confess that which the women know, confess that which the other apostles know, namely, that Christ is risen from the dead. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Well, after this then, Jesus concludes. He concludes this time with the apostles. And we can say they're all apostles now. Thomas is a part of this. He is a part of the apostles that are sent forth for sure. And Jesus gives a benediction here. He says, blessed are those who have not seen, and yet they believe. And it's really easy here to try to hit one group against the other. You know, those who have seen, they believe, but they have a, a, a simple faith, an easy faith. You know, we believe without sin. But that's not right. That is entirely wrong, and that's a, that's a misunderstanding of sin entirely. You know, what we see in the conversion of the apostles, what we see in the conversion of the women, what we see in our own conversion is simply God at work among us using the means that He desires to bring us to faith. And so there was a time when Christ was among us, and the disciples, that is, the apostles, believed. St. Paul talks about this. And that there was an occasion when 500 all together witnessed, and if you want to know who they are, you can write St. Paul, and they'll send you their names, and you can go and ask them whether this is true or not, and the fact is, it's true. And that was the means. These were the means that God used to bring them to faith and trust in Christ. The Christ who was born of the Blessed Virgin, the Christ who lived and fulfilled the law for us, the Christ who died for us, who rose for us, for us. These were the means that God used to bring them to that belief. But now we stand in a place and stand in a position where Christ is still at work among us, bringing us to faith. It didn't just work out this way. This is exactly what Christ instituted in the upper room so that we might come to believe. He sends out his apostles with these words. He sends out his apostles with this history and knowledge in mind. Not a knowledge that they read about in some book, but a knowledge that they saw and they could say to people, look, we saw these things. We were the eyewitnesses of these things. He sends these apostles out with that focused, focused mission of bringing people to the forgiveness of sins. So not just a general knowledge of God and the scriptures, but bringing people to the forgiveness of sins, you might even say in the fullest sense, bringing them to a knowledge of their sins and then the forgiveness of sins for Christ's sake. He grants to the apostles, that is, he grants to the church places like Holy Baptism and the Lord's Supper. And it is through all of these means and through all of these ways what we have is what Christ desires to send, what Christ desires to share, which is namely himself. Himself for us as the fulfiller of the law. Himself for us as the one who has overcome sin and death and the devil. Himself for us who are resurrected forevermore, alive forevermore, going forward into the future with the Father and the Spirit in His kingdom in which there is no end. And the great revelation that comes to us in places like these readings that we have during Easter is that we really do have now through these means of grace Christ himself. And when you have Jesus, when you have Christ, when you have that resurrected one granted to you in his word, in his sacraments, what you have is Christ and all of his blessings. You have his forgiveness. You have his love. You have his salvation. And in the context of what we read today, you have his peace. And so peace be with you. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. 
The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for all the people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. God of grace, bestow upon your church your Holy Spirit and all the gifts that come from on high. Grant to us faithful pastors who will preach faithfully and give us ears to hear your word proclaimed. Sustain us while apart and bring your scattered church together again quickly. Give us boldness in our witness before the world and courage to speak your name without fear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, give wisdom to the nations and their leaders. Bless us with faithful and just leaders who will protect the sanctity of life and defend us against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Make us wise and discerning citizens who use the gift of liberty for noble purpose. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of love, teach us to love one another as you have loved us. Guide us to make manifest the love and strength of Christ to our troubled and fearful world. Deliver us from disease and everything that would threaten our homes and families. Protect police, firefighters, disaster relief workers, and medical personnel who attend to us, as well as the places where we live and work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of comfort, Give your aid and relief to the sick in their afflictions, to those who are troubled in mind, to those to whom death draws near, and to all who suffer, especially Joanna Carner, Michael Pizzodontis, Luann Weber, Jim Keller, Zane Stoneberg, Bobby Phelps, Sally Tarver, Beth Rivers, Mary Jothi, Gloria Speckhardt, Kristen O'Hara, Leo Hoyer, Stephen Lang, Michael Taylor, Marsha Gariano, Sundala Adela, and Jane Sho. We also pray for all those suffering the effects of COVID-19 throughout the world, that those who are sick would be sustained in their afflictions and pain, and be healed according to your gracious will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of hope, be with those who grieve the loss of a loved one. We pray especially for the family of Davis Begay, Point them to the promise of the resurrection and the gift of everlasting life to all who die in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of compassion, bless us with all the good gifts of the earth, with the fruits of our honest labor, and with kind and generous hearts. Look on mercy upon the unemployed, especially the Hussein family. Open our eyes and hearts to the needs of the poor, that we might serve them in your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O blessed God and Lord, hear the prayers of your people, and teach us to trust in your will to answer our prayers with all that is needful and beneficial, both for us and for all for whom we pray. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant your church your Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes down from above, that your word may not be bound but have recourse and be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people. That in steadfast faith we may serve you, and in the confession of your name abide unto the end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.